started. As you said, um, I'm from the YWCA in Lancaster. We are the designated rape crisis center for our county. Um, as I've met a few of you, I've heard uh, that you're from different areas, so I do encourage you to look into that. Every county in Pennsylvania has a rape crisis center, um, and these centers, um, we have a 24-hour hotline. It's free counseling for survivors and their families, so that might be a parent or a sibling or um, a partner who's ever been impacted by the sexual assault. Uh, we also do education and primary prevention in our school systems, and we do community events like this, where we kind of give some information on whatever that community is looking for. Awesome, thank you. Okay. So I'm here today to talk about bystander intervention, which I'm really excited to follow up with that presentation because I talk a little bit about this call, this call to intervene and this call to help. So how many of you have been driving and you see a car accident or maybe the accident probably most of us. And a lot of times, we keep driving, right? We think to ourselves, oh, somebody, there's a lot of people around. Somebody's probably called 911. Help is definitely on the way, and we just keep going. Or maybe you're at home or at a cafe or in your car, and you hear two people arguing, um, or you hear a scream, and you think, oh, there's a lot of people around. Somebody closer to that is going to call for help. I'm sure that somebody's going to be there, and we just keep going, right? So if one or both of these stories resonate with you, you're not alone. There's actually um, a name for this because of how often it happens. It's called the bystander effect. So the bystander effect is this idea that individuals are less likely to offer support to people in need when there are more people present. So unfortunately, there's a famous example of this um, in 1964 with Kitty Genovese. Kitty Genovese was attacked, <coughs> beaten, raped, and murdered. Within a 30-minute span, 38 men and women witnessed that event at some point, and no one stepped in. So when this happened, researchers started thinking, why? Why did this happen? Why did no one intervene? And is this happening other places? And we found that yes, it is. Um, individuals are more likely to receive support on a back street where there's only one witness around than they are on a busy sidewalk or on a busy road. We all assume that somebody else is gonna step in. So that research led to program development and interventions like the bystander intervention, which is what I'm gonna to share today. So before I actually give you the intervention techniques, I wanna share a little bit about the why. Why should we intervene? There's a lot of reasons we should intervene. Um, we should intervene because we care about people and we wanna help. But some of the things I put up here are to decrease violence in our own community. So if we intervene and we're being proactive instead of reactive, we're gonna see less violence, less sexual violence, less physical violence in our own community. Another reason is it could decrease the time it takes for individuals to receive help. So as soon as you see something, you say something. That person, it could literally mean life or death. It could literally mean that person being assaulted or not. We need to intervene right away to decrease that time. And my third point here, I added in because this is Courage Conference and I want to go a little deeper into potentially what scripture tells us to do. So we are called to love our neighbors. So when I was thinking about this, I was brought to Luke 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So if you're not familiar with that, this story starts out by us hearing about a man who is walking down the road and he's beaten and robbed. And he's left on the side of the road and over time, three people pass. First, we have the priest who comes across him. He crosses the road, continues to walk, chooses to do nothing. The priest, who is literally his pastoral responsibility to show compassion, chooses not to. Next, we have the Levite, does the same thing, walks down the street, crosses over, chooses to do nothing. He doesn't help this man who's just been beaten and robbed. He knows the law to love his neighbor, yet he chooses to do nothing. Third, we have the Samaritan who comes across the man and decides to provide help. He helps him with his wound, and he goes above and beyond and even helps him find a place at the end to stay. So I like this parable because it's not a perfect example. These people weren't there while the harm was being done, but it is an example of how we should intervene to help. We're called to love our neighbors, and our neighbors aren't just living on the left and right of us. This parable is about loving everybody. So we need to intervene no matter what religion, what race, no matter what age, ethnicity, all of the above, we're called to help and to love and to show support. So at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, cool. 
I want to love my neighbor, I want to help, I want to intervene. But sometimes these situations aren't safe enough, right? Like we, some of these situations, it's not safe for us to insert ourselves in that situation. That's actually one of the most common responses is why people don't intervene. They said it wasn't safe, so they just went along the way. Um, some other responses were that people were scared, that they don't want to make anyone angry. We don't want to make this worse. We don't want to upset anyone. Other reasons are that they might be misunderstanding the situation. I think a lot of times we're like, oh, it's just a little argument. Like, it's fine. Um, it's probably not what I think it is. So we're misunderstanding. We think that others are more qualified. So in the example of the parable, the priest and the Levite are more qualified to show compassion and to love, yet they choose not to, and the Samaritan does. So don't think that you're not qualified or that you can't provide support, because you can, and we can all do it in our own way, in a way that's comfortable for us. Um, other reasons are that it's none of our business. I think a lot of times in our society we think, it's none of our business, we just need to stay out of it and stay in our own little bubble and leave that other people to handle that. Um, and another reason is that people are just unsure. They're unsure of how to help. So this brings me to the action steps. How do we overcome these concerns that we have? How do we intervene? So I have three words, if you remember nothing else from my presentation that I want you to take home with you today. We have the three Ds, direct, delegate, and distract. So first we have this direct. If you're a bold person, if the situation is safe enough and you feel comfortable, be direct, insert yourself, and you can insert yourself in the situation and talk to the victim and say, are you okay? Can I help you? You could insert yourself by intervening with the person that's causing harm. You can tell them, cut it out, stop, I see you. I have up here, it says, that isn't funny, and I wanna point that out specifically. Intervening isn't just intervening when harm is being done. Intervening is when you hear that racist joke or that joke about sexual assault or rape, right? We need to intervene in those moments before we teach our culture, our society, our community that that's okay before those words turn into action. So that's intervening as well, okay? Um, say that it's not safe to intervene. Say that that's just not who you are to insert yourself in the situation, that's okay. There's another option. We're gonna go to delegate. So you can delegate, and if not all of you, most of you probably have cell phones, so you have the ability to call 911. You can delegate to the police. They literally get paid to provide support and help. So <laughs> you always have that option. Um, another option is if you wanna delegate like right away, you could delegate to a friend, a partner, a boss, a bartender, somebody in that environment who maybe has some authority, you can delegate to them to intervene and they can be direct. Uh, say that you have your kids with you and you, you wanna be direct, but it's not safe, you don't wanna get them involved. Take your kids, step aside, talk to your partner and say, hey, can you go say something? We'll be over here and come meet us after. Okay, so you can delegate to someone. The important thing is that you're delegating to somebody who's actually gonna do something. We're not delegating to a stranger who's gonna continue to walk by and cross over the street, okay? All right, so say that you don't wanna be direct, you don't wanna insert yourself directly into what's happening, but you feel like you could say something. Um, you could distract. So you can distract the individual by asking for the time, asking for directions. If you're out um, you know, at a, a bar or dancing, you could go up to that victim and say, hey, let's go dance and pull them over. All you wanna do is give that victim a second to escape from that situation, okay? Um, it also acknowledges um, that we see you, um, that uh, people see that you're here and see what's happening, and that may be enough to stop. So I just wanna share a quick personal example. A few weeks ago, I was talking with my family at dinner, and I was sharing about the bystander intervention and three Ds, and I was talking about what I'm gonna be presenting. And fast forward a few weeks, we're on our way home from vacation, we're driving on the highway, and there is clearly an accident that had just happened. Somebody is sitting on the ground, there's people walking, there's about five or six cars along the side of the road. And as I'm driving, my first thought is, wow, that's a lot of people. I'm sure that somebody has already called for help. Right, so I teach this, and that is still my first thought. Somebody's probably called for help. Well, luckily, in that same moment, my husband picked up the phone, called 911, and reported the accident. And they said on the phone, thank you, it's already been reported, help us on the way. Took 30 seconds of his time. 
But in that moment, he hangs up and looks at me and he goes, look, I delegated. <laughs> and I've never been prouder of my family. Um, so, um, you know, in that moment, I forgot. But because I'm sharing these techniques and I'm talking about it, hopefully somebody in that moment is going to think quickly and think through these three Ds, maybe before I've had a chance to do that. So these three things, you can do one of them. You always have an opportunity. If it's not safe, remove yourself from the situation, then call 911. No one's going to be upset if you call 911 and it's already been reported, all right? So I was thinking about the golden rule, right? So treat others as you want to be treated, um, also known as Matthew 7, 12, okay? So say that you're in a traumatic moment, frozen in that moment, which is typically how that goes, our bodies freeze in trauma. Um, would you want somebody to step in and provide some help to you? Probably, right? So society teaches us to treat others the way we want to be treated. Um, scripture tells us to love our neighbors, all of our neighbors. So, okay, so I want to say, no matter what religion, no matter what ethnicity, age, ability you have, you should step in, you should intervene, and you should help. So, let's love our neighbors.